I'm in here somewhere, I swear I'm hiding in here. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're here in Kentucky. You can see it's chilly and you can see my breath. I wanted to set up today's episode, which is actually from Clarksville, Tennessee. If you didn't get what you wanted for Christmas, well, this shop definitely has it. So it is one of the most fully packed old school antique shops I've seen in a really long time. So let's go explore it and have some fun. looks like it's a couple of buildings that were added onto or put together over the years and anyone who's been in the antique and vintage reselling business for a while eventually finds out that no matter how much you sell that there's so much cool stuff that you'll probably need more room and so I bought a storage house these people expanded their shop uh, my friend in Seattle opened a mall everybody ends up needing more space and so obviously they added on a few times and and we are going to go inside and see what they've got in there because the pictures I saw, it looks like it's just super packed. And wow, this place is packed for sure. There are all sorts of, wow, nooks and crannies and a ton of stuff. So it may be interesting to film. I'm not sure we're going to be able to step back from it enough to show you everything, but uh, this could be exciting and they said that they were willing to deal with dealers. And, you know, if you're a reseller, don't be afraid to ask in an antique store what they do for dealer discount, because you might be surprised. You might be able to afford more than you realize. Oh, yes. I imagine that crazy lamp lady would get very excited about this, at least a few of them. This one here is old dragonware with an interesting shade from the 50s. This is that Moriaga or Moriage. Sumi talks about that a lot. It's where it's applied enamel on the surface so that it becomes three-dimensional. And enamel is like a paint suspended in glass, so then when you cook it, it turns into this thing that cooks onto the surface. And then there's some nice Limoges pieces here. It looks like there's a 26-piece set of this with the Gudrun Rose, which is a pretty popular pattern in Limoges. And $90 for 26 pieces is actually pretty reasonable. And the, very hard to read, but you can see Theodore Havlin, lots of lamps, lots of photos. You could spend a lot of time well, prowling through old photo albums. And sometimes there's some really great stuff. There can be individual pictures worth hundreds of dollars if you luck out, but they're very specific. Tons of records, and these seem to be show tunes, best of the birds. This is more the era that I look for, um, 60s and 70s albums. The most valuable are not compilations like this, they're the early pressings. Like if you had the 1965 version of the birds that was in mono rather than stereo, that's rather valuable. Uh, for some reason, the mono records, because they switched over to stereo in the 60s, if you have a rock band and it's on mono, those are almost always worth a lot more than the stereo version. <coughs> more toys, I see a cute dime bank in here. I'll have to take a look at that a little bit later. There's a Pac-Man lunchbox for $8, which is a great price, but the condition not so great. And then we've got some Fisher-Price pieces, Bob's Big Boy. I mean, this place is certainly packed. The Swan set, yeah. Yeah, this is a 1950s or 60s set, and they're cute with the screen printing, but a little more than I'd want to pay. Now, I like these jackpot things, and if it works, which I'm not sure you can tell. Oh, it does. I never win. It actually was made in Reno, Nevada, surprisingly enough. And it does look like the old uh, slot machine. So I'm probably going to get that piece because I've had these before and they usually sell. People think they're kind of a cool novelty. These look Italian. 
from the 20th century. There were 19th century makers who did similar, but the gold in the bottom makes me think it's 20th century. Might take a look at those. And then I see a bunch of flow blue. And we also see an old coffee mill. Those are things that sell pretty readily because there's so many people who grind beans and do espresso these days. In here, we've got a bunch of RS Prussia and other European porcelain. Not a real fast seller, unless you get really unusual and beautiful pieces or can price it really cheap, so probably not for me. Little Japanese figures. These two are Corday, and they used to go for big prices. I still think they're cute. They were made in America in the 1940s, and you can see in the faces the quality of the porcelain. But then they did kind of applied lace as well, and it's hard to find them in good shape, and it's hard to find them without dust because they collected dust very easily in those little lacy bits. The flamingo is definitely something I need to see. I'm always looking for flamingos. Oh, but his neck's broken. Darn it. That's too bad. He, with the wings up, would be a really good one worth about $50 or $60 in my world. Maybe this. They have it marked as Blanco, but it's actually Peking glass from China. And sometimes when you see something mislabeled, you get a good deal. So I'm going to take a look at that, too. We are in linen land all of a sudden. This place is really stacked to the ceilings. There are a ton of old hats and some pretty cute ones. I like this one here. I expect Phyllis Stiller to have worn. And I'm sure I'll wear it about as well. There we go. Lovely, don't you think? <laughs> yes, well, she definitely had a style about her. And this is pretty cool. I have to say I like that one. I don't usually look for hats because a lot come my way. But if they're sparkly and spangly and really a little bit more special, then yeah. Oh boy, there are quilts and embroidery and just piles and piles of it. I'm sure there's some really beautiful pieces in here. Um, I don't see a lot of old, old quilts, but what I do see in the next space, which is, wow, I'm in here somewhere, I swear, I'm hiding in here. The other thing that is pretty cool is on the other side there, oh wait, there's an old quilt top, I'll look at that, and then we're going to take a look at Afghans because afghans are a thing now. It's interesting to me to see them starting to sell like quilts. People are starting to catch on to the fact that they're handmade. There's a lot of different designs. There's good, better, and best. And if you find ones that are really well done, they can be really attractive. And we've got lots of colors. This is probably from around the bicentennial because it's red, white, and blue. Orange and avocado and harvest gold. That's going to be about 1970, of course. And so many of these were made in the 70s. And let's see, this one is a style that we see occasionally where they have little flowers or other things that come off three-dimensionally. And so these are a little bit more involved. They were harder to make and they're a little more collectible now. So this one is $20. And for one that's a little more unusual with this sort of three dimension, that's not bad. I was just doing this show in uh, Mount Dora and my neighbor had a whole bunch of Afghans. It was a little bit cool that weekend and she sold all but one. And she had about 45 or $50 on one similar to this and she got it. So this might be something to buy. It's also large, and large is better because more people have queen size and king size beds now, so they're not looking for little ones as much, although they might use them as a throw on a couch or something. A couple of things. Speaking of the bicentennial, this is pretty groovy. This is for the JCs, which is the Junior Chamber of Commerce in America. I've never known anyone who was a JC, but somebody was at this point, and in Pennsylvania at that. And so this is kind of fun. I'm going to ask about this piece because it's just so loud and so period. And look at the collar. It's definitely 70s. I think it might look good on. It seems like it's my size. So yeah, we'll take that up to the front and find out about that. And now we see another rack. I don't know how to get in here, but I'm going to just wiggle my way through. Love a crowded store. Okay, so we got to take a look at this. 
This is four dollars. It is full on polyester. It's actually. Am I wrong? Is it cute? I kind of think maybe it is. I mean, polyester isn't a fabric I usually like to buy, but this might sell. It's an ugly cute. Yeah, that's the problem. I don't know if that makes it cute or ugly. Mm, and it's handmade. I always look for a label. People usually don't prefer handmade. For the price, it might just sell, especially with those wide lapels. That's very 70s. And if you put these together, well, there is a lovely ensemble. So we'll take this up and see what they say. 90s don't typically sell very well. Um, this stuff really has to be very special for people to want to wear things that are undergarments. So I don't really see anything there, but I do like these. So we're going to carry on and carry them on. Boy, it is really tight in here. More groovy colors of afghans. Here I am. Wow, so I am deep in afghan land here. And there's Christmas color afghan with black. Strange combination. And then this one is kind of fun because it actually is open yarn and the end is fringed. And you've got some really bright orange reds. These are good colors that people look for now. This is Christmas 1975. Tomato soup red and avocado green and a little bit of forest green for good measure. It is something that actually would probably make a great tree skirt. There's some Blue Ridge back here. I just bought a bunch of pieces at an estate the other day. This was all made in Tennessee and is probably more collectible here than anywhere. You know, these with the more complicated patterns, I mean, this is priced at 10, but they can sell for 15 and 20. A lot of the apple patterns are pretty popular as well. Anything with a Christmas tree in Blue Ridge is very collectible. They were all hand painted by women who had no formal education at all and lived in Appalachia, where the factory was. And they built the factory specifically so they could employ women there who needed jobs, who had the skill of hand painting because they all learned toll painting. It was just part of the culture. And so they made all this great dinnerware for about 20 years. Now, we've got lots of tablecloths here. And I do like the old tablecloths. I particularly look for the ones that have states with the various tourist attractions printed on them. It really takes a lot of work to keep linens nice. It's nice that they have these all hung high like this so that you don't end up with a big heap on the floor. Oh, I think it's time to go look at the other part, which they said is even more crowded than this. Oh, the quantity of things here is amazing. You can tell this shop has been here a long time and that it is somebody's real love. Look at the way they're stacking casserole dishes. I've never seen casserole dishes stacked like this before. This place is just stuffed full of merchandise. So there's a bunch of pie birds, and I like pie birds, but I think that since there's four that are just alike, they're probably more recent reproductions. A lot of those were made in the 80s and 90s when people started collecting the original ones from England from the 40s and 50s. They started making ones that sort of look like it. You can tell the difference side by side, but those are definitely newer. These painted Burmese pieces are hard to find. They didn't last long in the line because they were difficult to make. Then, wow, there's a whole case full of toothpick holders. They certainly have a little of, every, well, I shouldn't say a little. They certainly have a lot of every category <laughs> that they have. And I see pieces, again, this is Cutcher glass from about 1900 that would glow under a black light. In fact, I think I'm curious to see what that one might run if it actually opens. There we go. Okay, this was a souvenir of Granger's Picnic. I'm not sure what Granger's Picnic was. It sounds like some big event, but that's kind of cute. Resin grapes. That's definitely a 60s, 70s thing where you could get the kit and make your own version. Amber is not my favorite color in them. If I see the purple or the blue or the red, I grab those almost every time I see them. Um, this piece here is a piano lamp, and this is kind of interesting because it is it was actually made to stand next to a piano. That's why it has the big stand here. And this one was originally kerosene, 
and it looks like it was converted at some point to be an electric lamp. A lot of people did that in the 60s. Uh, it unfortunately devalues them. I like the old clocks, and I did just sell one like this, so let's see if it works. It does not seem to. That's, well, maybe. We're not there yet. Feels wound pretty tight already, though. We'll shake it. Gotta shake it to make it run sometimes. But no, unfortunately, this one is not working anymore. It's too bad because it was a decent price, actually. And I did just sell one for $80 myself. And with the dealer discount here, I probably would have sprung for it. But it's got to work. On the other hand, they do have some jewelry caskets. And these are things that I am running out of because they've been selling rather well. These all, this one has the silk lining. These all date to about 1900, 1910. They were referred to as jewelry caskets, which sounds a little morbid, but it just had a different connotation then. And they usually have some maker mark on the bottom, as this one does. For $8, I'm definitely getting this one. You don't see the squarish, rectangular shapes as often, and this has a nice Art Nouveau handle. It's $20. It doesn't have the liner, and it's a little worn. I'm tempted. I'm not sure about that. This one is 18. It doesn't have the handle. The color is a little better on it though, but on the back it seems like it's worn off some because this gold was like a plating. And so I think I'll probably just get the one little one, but it's nice to have another one of these because they really are popular. People seem to like boudoir items and for boudoir they really like Art Nouveau. They like things that are 100 years old or more because of the flowing style of it. Even a piece of furniture hidden under there. I'm snooping into their bathroom, which I'm sure is not really what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, I'm going to set this down at the counter, and then we're going to go look in the back 40, because I hear that's really crowded. Okay, here we go. Wow. Ah, yes, this is the chili back room, and I guess that's why they have it uh, shut off, but... This is pretty great. I mean, I wasn't expecting this at all. There are a whole bunch of Tyrex bowls in various patterns. They have the whole primary color set here. And, you know, it's priced about retail, but I don't blame them because this stuff is popular right now. Okay, so now we're going to see the problem with Tyrex. Tyrex is great stuff, but the colors are fired on. If you dishwash it, these are Pyrex dishes from about 1960 it will eventually go away. It's just going to fade out. It's just the way that it is because it was not meant to be dishwashed over and over. So if you're collecting Pyrex, hand washing is not a bad idea, especially because it's mostly mixing bowls. You're not going to use them that often. Lots of glass. Now, kitchen glass always seems to do well. This jar with the morning glories is priced at 26 and that's about retail on that piece. Again, we're in an antique store, so they're going to charge retail for a lot of things. And on the other hand, there are some things that uh, I think are a good bargain, and I've got three or four things up at the counter already. Okay, if we can wiggle through here. Wow, this is just crazy how full this is, huh? And we're going to wiggle through here. There's a really good stool here that I'm sure they won't let me buy, that I like a lot. It is completely in the way, but I'm sure they're using it. However, I'm going to take it out of the way so we can walk through here, and I might even ask about it just for fun. So there's more aisles. I don't really know which way to go, but I think we can get through this way. So let's try this. Ooh, it's a tight squeeze. Good thing I'm skinny. This is uh, when you're crawling around in old stores and barns and attics. It definitely pays to be thin. I used to want to be a big muscle man, but it turns out for this business, you need enough muscles to lift things, but you definitely don't need to be too burly. I think we're trapped. I think we have to buy something or they won't let us leave. Lots of blue violin bottles. Those are kind of cute. They were a novelty. And yes, I believe we are going to get stuck if we try to go any farther. I imagine not many people have been down this aisle in a long, long time. But it is kind of fun. <laughs> now, this would be the place to spend some time. They have tons and tons and tons of 45 records, and I'm sure that there's something in there that's worth money. 
some early pressing, some one hit wonder, some garage band that didn't get famous, that is now a cult favorite. Um, that's some promotional copy that was done just for someone to use. Oh yes, when table lighters started to be replaced by Bic lighters, this was one of the first things that they did. You'd put, this one was for the cricket lighter, and you'd put it in this little thing so that you would actually, of course the lighter's long dead, but you would actually have the equivalent of a table lighter, and this is by Cricut. And it is a whopping quarter. This is from about 1979, and I'm going to buy it because I have a hunch that somebody online knows what this is and will like this. So this is a Western fish fillet knife, and while fishing knives are not as valuable as pocket knives typically, Western is a good brand. It's marked on the blade right above the handle. I don't know if that'll be able to come in or not. But Western is definitely a brand to look for. And since this has a wooden handle and a leather sheath, if it's under, say, 5 or $7, I'll definitely buy it, because they typically sell for about 15 to 20 and more potentially depending on what they are. So that's kind of nice that I just happened to see that in that random, random box of stuff. This is definitely a place you could dig and dig and dig and dig for a day and not see everything. Oh, thank goodness. An aisle I can actually, ooh, stand straight in. Bunch of Fiesta. Again, this store's been here a long time. Some of these prices are yesterday's prices, and some of them are good prices for today. The Blue Fiesta Cup hasn't sold for $20 in many, many years. On the other hand, you know, I've got stuff that's costing a few dollars, and I see here on the back this knife is $4. I didn't see the price at first, so I'm buying it. Always liked these cannonball pitchers from Hall China. These are from the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. The round mark means it's before 1969. Then it changed to a sort of oval mark with uh, upper and lowercase letters. And other companies made similar. This one is probably by Padre or Garden City. I don't know who Buzzy Bunny was, but there he is. I look at screen print glasses to see if there's anything that jumps out that's interesting old advertising or that sort of thing. And... This one is actually pretty cool. If there was a whole set of these, I would buy them to take to Florida. This is only a dollar and a quarter, and it's got seahorses. It's got the goldfish. It's actually a pretty neat-looking piece. And if I could get enough of these to make a set, I would definitely buy them. But I've never seen this one before. So while it must be uncommon, it may be uncommon enough that getting a whole set would be tough for me. Here's to friends and song and laughter. Don't envy us our morning after, so we're going to get drunk and have a killer hangover. This one's only $2, so I'm going to buy it because we, we see decanters that go with this. Can Can Girl is a good motif. This should sell. I'm also interested in this one because this is a swanky swig. It looks completely filthy, but I do believe that'll clean off. And this actually is not one I've seen often before. It has the Eiffel Tower and the woman at the cafe, so we're going to give that a shot. This one says, Howdy, Colonel! And I believe that's referring to Kentucky Colonels. And there is a big legend on the back talking about, I give you a man dedicated to the good things of life. Gentlemen, I give you the Kentucky Colonels. And since I have a mall space in Kentucky and I've never seen that one before, and it's only $2, I'm going to buy that too. So actually, we had a little bit of fun in random glass land, a little more than I thought I would. Here's another one that's 50s. This one's $6, which is about the right price, 6 to 8 on these, so I'm not going to buy it. But whenever you see the Scotty screen print, if they're a few dollars, pick them up, because people love anything with Scotties. And one trick, look on the inside of the glass to make sure the color is the same on the inside as the out, because fading is a killer on these. And sometimes they'll have faded on one side and you won't really notice it because you'll just think it was like a pastel color, but it turns out it was supposed to be red. And if I don't run into it all and knock it on my head, I could see getting buried in here. There was a horrible story, and it's true, about a, a, a hoarder estate where the wife had gone missing and the husband died a couple years later. And when they cleaned out the hoard, the wife had been buried in the hoard and died and was never seen again. Ooh. 
little scary in here. I got to move a few things to pick one up. So there's that. There's that. And now, this place is definitely a juggling act. Ta da! Here we go. The giant syrup of the drip cut. You see this all the time in the small version that was used for sugar or syrup. You never see the big one. And this one's priced at 10, with the discount would make it nine. My big question is, does it open easily? And it does not appear that it does. So I'm not gonna take it, unfortunately. They should work easily with one hand. That's what they were made to do. So if it doesn't, then it's not gonna be functional. Well, it could be stuck with syrup, but I hear rattling. I think the spring is broken. Royal Copley out of Ohio. This verifies what I was saying earlier. Look at the bottom. I know this one's Copley because I've had it a bunch of times, and this one just doesn't have its paper label. But these stripes on the bottom with the dry feet tell you that it's Royal Copley. And he's waiting by the mailbox for the mailman because he wants to bite him. Okay, this is actually a surprise. This little piece doesn't look like a big deal. But this is Glidden pottery, and Glidden was uh, the name of the fellow, and some Glidden is actually very pricey. This is a very basic piece. You can kind of see the name Glidden in there, but some of the pieces, like the ones that have circus designs, for example, and some of the modernist pieces they did that are more substantial are actually good money, so that's a good name to look for. It just goes on and on and on, and... I think we are back into cookbooks and, oh, here's a bunch of Shawnee corn. These are neat pieces. Everybody likes these because they have the corn motif. And this one has the nice Shawnee mark on the bottom. There's Cord Queen and Corn King, and the colors are what vary. Um, prices on these, you know, the mixing bowls, they have it like 35 and 40 a piece. Okay. Well, I picked this up because it's Walt Disney World. This is from right after it opened in 1971. This is Howe's Art, which made little glass trays for advertising. They were based in Pennsylvania. And they uh, all of the different attractions shown, and it's only $4. So I will take that to Florida, where it will sell for about 10 Ah, back to where we can breathe. <laughs> this is a big selection of Homer Lachlan Virginia Rose, and the prices are pretty good on this. Six dollars for the little creamer is quite reasonable. Um, the plates have the nice pattern on. They seem to be in good shape. This is very popular about 1940, and when you look at the bottom, 40s and 50s, F50 means 1950 in this case. That actually is a date code. Homer Lachlan made Fiesta, but this was a fancy pattern they made about the same time. So Cranberry All has a little bit of 14, uh, 22 karat gold thrown into the batch in order to get that color. So that's why Cranberry has always been a little more expensive. So Bride's Basket, which looks like a Victorian piece, is 150. This piece, which is a, I believe this one is actually Fenton glass, and that one's priced at 30 and so you can see the difference between the older and the new as far as values go. This bride's bowl is $56. That's actually quite inexpensive. Over here, the Bristol glass. These were made in England and America in the late 1800s and very early 1900s. This one's ceramic, so we'll take that out. But all the rest of this is glass. It's hand-painted. It's hand-blown. Really nice pieces. The urn is especially an unusual piece, and it's only $19. Now, it's not a functional urn. It's just a decoration. This one has the pontal mark where they break off the glow stem. It's always surprised me that that stuff didn't sell for more. And I'm always tempted to buy it every time I see it. And I may buy that urn because it really is an unusual thing. I just have this feeling that someday people are going to appreciate it more. It's a real sleeper, in my opinion.
And then these pieces are ceramic. These are going to be Austrian from about 1900, 1910, and they're quite substantial. They're $70 each, and that's not bad because they're unusual in their forms, probably by the Carlsbad Company uh, out of Austria. Pedigos turned out to be a lot of fun. It was sure jam-packed with stuff, and there wasn't a ton that I could buy, but there were really good prices on the things I did get, so that was great. And at the very end, I found these, and these are really cool, and I don't get them often anymore. They are Black Forest carved German bottle stoppers from the 1950s, uh, right about the time the war ended they were looking for things they could make easily and so they started doing these mechanical things so they take their hat off they put their glasses on all this kind of stuff and it was just a fun thing to play with while you were uh, drinking i guess you know social drinking and parties were a big thing in the 50s and 60s and these are pretty collectible now they're worth about 20 to 25 a piece and i got the entire set of five for 28 minus 10 percent so i was really happy about that it's probably the best score all day Anyway, I'm going to go shop a little bit more, and then we'll end up uh, showing you what we got. I'm sure we'll have a haul video coming up and lots of fun from Clarksville. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below. Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at the Antique Nomad. Bye for now.